Uh, next speaker on the program is uh, Dr. Mark Levine, and he will discuss uh, vitamin C and immune function. Dr. Is there a... Uh, light, you can turn the light uh, on and off. And where, how do I... Uh, oh, you can tell her she's doing it. That's more effective. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So you can just tell her your slides. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here. And to thank the organizers for selecting me to receive an award yesterday evening. I'm really honored. I want to thank them. Today, I've actually been asked to speak about several things. One of them is vitamin C and mechanisms of its action in immune cells. Another one has been uh, in reference to some of the clinical trials that we're trying to do at the National Institutes of Health. A third thing is clinical uh, important findings about ascorbic acid, both things that you should not worry about and things that you should. And lastly, about measurement problems. This is a bit of a tall order for uh, 24 minutes. And the best way that I thought to do this was to give you a framework about how to uh, approach vitamin requirements. And then I hope that these issues will follow from, uh, from this framework. Can I, how do I get the first slide? Thank you. This slide will be on your exam after the session. <laughs> and what you're looking at is vitamin C biosynthesis. Here's vitamin C at the top. And the important thing is we're missing the ability to convert this step, which is off the screen. And that's all you need to know, that most mammals have this enzyme and we don't. And the consequences on the next slide are that we have to ingest vitamin C rather than make it. And, and this is really a converted audience. Uh, you know about the recommended dietary allowances, but I'd like to tell you in a little detail about these dietary allowances for vitamin C and how they're determined. Is there a way to put on the uh, lights in the hall and leave the, the lights off here at the screen? That might be a little easier for some of you. I'm not sure I know how to do that up here. Well, if you can't do it, that's okay. There, the recommended dietary allowances are based on three things. And the important things that you need to know are that the, the first idea was preventing the, def well, maybe it doesn't show. I'll have to be off. Are preventing the deficiency disease scurvy. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Now, hopefully none of you will see this. Scurvy can be thought of as the four H's, which are listed here. And there's actually a list of about 30 symptoms and signs which are seen in scurvy. How do we know about these things? Well, it, it, it's, I think, worthwhile to know about the basis of these studies. These were done in volunteers who were actually prisoners in the Iowa State Penitentiary. There were six of them. They were given artificial scurvy, and actually the information of our RDAs is based on five volunteers, so-called volunteers, because one escaped, and he was one of the lucky ones. <laughs> and he really was one of the lucky ones because some of the signs and symptoms that these unfortunate folks were given were not very pleasant. But the bottom line was that these signs and symptoms could be prevented with 12 milligrams per day of vitamin C, multiply times five as a magic factor, and voila, we have 60 milligrams. Also in these patients, some of them were given radio-labeled vitamin C. And what was measured once they had deficiency for many, many months, they were given very small amounts. And what was measured was the excretion of the radio-label in its unchanged form. Can I have the next slide, please? And uh, what was found that was that the label was excreted when the volunteers were receiving a dose of 60 milligrams. The label was excreted in its unchanged form. So this is a second basis for the recommended dietary allowance for vitamin C. Next slide, please. Does, does this make sense? Now, there, you, you've heard before that there are many reasons that this doesn't make sense. I won't, go, I won't belabor the point, but I would like to talk about a couple of issues, again, in detail, because many of you have heard the information, but I think it's worthwhile to know what it's based on. 
One of the pieces of information that the uh, RDA for vitamin C doesn't make sense is based on animal synthetic rates. Next slide. This is just a compendium that, in the next slide, is a compendium of synthetic rates uh, of vitamin C uh, estimates from different uh, mammals. And humans are at the bottom. Now, where do these numbers come from? That's what I really want you to know. Next slide, please. If, if you just, you don't have to look at those numbers, and, and I'm sure Dr. Pauling will mention them too, but the upshot of those numbers is that the RDA is anywhere from one tenth to a thousandth of what animals make. But you need to know how those numbers came. These were experiments from Leninger's laboratory in the late 1950s, and the idea was to take hepatic microsomes, where the enzymes are located for vitamin C synthesis, to isolate these microsomes, pieces of cells, and feed substrate, measure the amount of ascorbic acid produced per hour, multiply times 24 hours, multiply times the weight of the liver, and then uh, come up with the weight of the animal, which was known, and you could get the numbers in the table. And the, the point of telling you this is that those numbers are not exact. Their guesses and what they tell us, they make a suggestion, but in my opinion, they don't conclusively tell us that the biosynthetic rates are as widely different as we might believe. But they're a clue. There are other clues, and I, I won't belabor this except to just tell you what it is. In the next slide, primates in captivity need a lot more vitamin C. And this is just a listing of different studies. You don't have to look here, it's just a clue for me. But primates in captivity need a lot more vitamin C based on a body weight than our so-called RDA. And this amount might be as much as five grams, and the endpoint was death, survival of these animals in captivity. Again, uh, a suggestive piece of evidence. Next slide, please. I think another issue that you've heard about is dietary ingestion. I won't belabor that point either, except to say that in a, in a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, we can consume approximately eight to 10 times the RDA. Now, the RDA would be a problem, or we would, we would be worried about it if there were issues of toxicity. And I'd like to talk about um, these potential, uh, both non-toxicities and toxicities. Next slide. I think that the, the important message here is that the toxicities of ascorbic acid are very, very rare. But you need to know what they are. Um, the most important one is actually used uh, therapeutically to help pregnant women absorb iron. And vitamin C keeps iron in its Fe2 reduced form, iron 2 form, and therefore helps iron absorption. But this could be a danger in patients who are subject to iron overload. And these are listed on the first line, patients with hemochromatosis, uh, patients with uh, uh, some kinds of thalassemias, and maybe sideroblastic anemia, although that's arguable. Uh, this, the, the hemochromatosis trait is rare. It's really unclear what happens in heterozygotes, and my guess is that I doubt ascorbic acid will, will cause any problem with iron absorption in, in almost all people. But you need to know about these few. The next issue is an important clinical one for false negatives in occult blood. Now, as clinicians interested in cancer, you're going to be screening your patients for occult blood and stool. And vitamin C will block the, the positive color, the blue color that you will see on the hemocult or fecal cards. And again, it's because it keeps, uh, vitamin C keeps iron in its reduced form. It's a problem issue. The companies will not divulge how much vitamin C will cause a problem. And the best information that I've been able to find out is that uh, you probably should stop ascorbic acid ingestion of supplements in your patients if you're interested in screening for occult blood and stool for at least a day. The next issue is kidney stones. And again, this is an issue which has received a lot of hype. The, the bottom line with these data are that there is no increase in oxalate excretion at doses under four grams a day. And I doubt it at doses over four grams a day either. But there is some question about doses for over four grams a day. Hyperuric acuria has been reported, but this has been in an experimental setting, and I don't think it has relevance to most clinical practice. Next slide, please. There are other misconceptions, which are true misconceptions about vitamin C toxicity conditioning, namely people who are on supplements who suddenly stop. Uh, there's been some hoopla that they will get rebound scurvy, and I think it's just not true. Uh, there have been reports which are wrong of uh, hemolysis 
of, uh, of red cells, one uh, case report, and these other things, I think, are, just cannot be substantiated. So the bottom line is we're dealing with a non-toxic substance, except under the instances that I showed you. I think the most important concept is that uh, of the RDA that's wrong is that just because we've corrected minimal ain't says we've done anything about optimal. And you've heard that message before, but I think it's very important to hear it again. Next slide. There have been other ways to think about optimal requirements, and that's been the problem. How do you measure optimal? What, what do you do? What tells you that a vitamin is at its optimal concentration? It could be vitamin C. It could be some other vitamin. These are some of the things that have been used in the past, and the problem has been with many, but not all of them, that they have not been as specific as we would like to bring into general practice and general acceptance. And what's missing in the next slide is or, or really this is said here, I think, in a very eloquent, eloquent way. Dr. Pauling has brought this issue to the forefront in the 70s that we really need to think about vitamin requirements again. But the issue has been around even before that, and this is one of my favorite quotes from the 1940s from David Perla and Jesse Marmiston. It was actually written about vitamin A, but the bottom line is minimal isn't optimal, but we can't figure out what optimal is because we don't know how to measure it. And what we have thought about as measuring optimal, next slide, is a very simple concept, is to measure how much does what. What is the function of the vitamin, of any vitamin, to produce uh, on a, what we call a dose response curve, how much does what. And on the next slide, if we look at the functions of vitamin C, please, this, is, uh, this will come up again. The idea is just to show you that there are myriad functions of vitamin C, both enzymatic, chemical, non-enzymatic, and even where we don't know what vitamin C does in many places. But the idea is to ask for these different reactions on the next slide, how much does what for each of them? Now, this is all theory. Is this possible? Namely, this might be neutrophils, this might be lymphocytes, this might be an enzyme, this might be another enzyme. Is it possible to think about vitamin requirements in a true biochemical way? in a substrate, concentration-dependent substrate relationship for biochemists. And we believe it is. Next slide, please. And we've developed a whole bunch of principles showing that this is true. I'm not going to talk about these today, but the bottom line is it is possible to think about vitamin requirements for vitamin C based on, on this kind of relationship. Uh, next slide. This was just a cue slide for me. But I'd like to return here. Now, how does this have to do with immune cells? The reason it has to do with immune cells is I wanted you to have the framework of how much does what. And immune cells, unfortunately, show up down here at the bottom. And they contain very high amounts of vitamin C, um, or have been reported to. And the idea of asking how much does what, or to take the principles that flew by on that last slide and apply them to immune cells. How much does what? And that means also how much can we regulate inside in cells? Can we regulate what's inside? Where does the vitamin go? Once we know that we can regulate concentrations across a range, what reactions can we pick that we predict might be influenced by those different concentrations? So that's the approach I'd like to talk with you about immune cells. But I'd also like to tell you a little bit about what's been known. Now, there are two kinds of immune cells I'm going to focus on, phagocytes and lymphocytes. Uh, for lymphocytes, I hope that Dr. Pauling is going to speak about his observations in, in uh, tumor cells. I can tell you a little bit that there have been variable reports of vitamin C action in lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are cells that are waiting to get stimulated to make antibodies, to make cytotoxins, or to actually eat and kill other cells such as cancer cells. And the effect of vitamin C on immunoglobulin production, unfortunately, has been variable. There are some uh, reports of lymphocytes that are killed by concentrations of vitamin C, including uh, a poster session, uh, one of the posters here at this session. There was another report last year. I can think of mechanisms why these uh, observations might occur, but we just don't know why they occur, and we don't know if they would occur under physiological conditions. I think it's important that we find out, but we don't know. There have been observations also that dehydroascorbic acid, the metabolite, and I didn't show you that yet, um, but that metabolite is higher in cancer cells. Um, it's not clear if that's true. It's not clear why it's true. I would submit that one of the key problems here is what I call an assay problem. How do you measure 
how do you know what you've measured, what we've measured, so that you can trust the measurement? I, I will use something that we use in the lab, a phrase, garbage in, garbage out. It's important to know that you can trust the measurement. If you can't, then what you conclude is questionable. And uh, unfortunately for lymphocyte function, some of the things that we rely on are not as helpful as we would like to tell us what the mechanism of action is, although there are some clues, but we don't have a clear understanding from lymphocytes. I'll tell you one approach that we've tried to use to get at this problem in a few minutes. There are some other just uh, little things that you should know. Uh, for example, an IL-2 therapy, uh, which doesn't relate directly to lymphocytes, although indirectly, yes, there have been dramatic uh, reports of dramatic decreases in ascorbic acid in plasma and urinary excretion. And, and these have been uh, really, I think, shamefully ignored by the investigators. We don't know what they mean. And lastly, about lymphocytes, this is not directly related to cancer, but to immune function. There are uh, a very nice series of reports from a Canadian investigator about idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, which can be corrected by ascorbic acid. And uh, actually, it was a nurse who had read some of Dr. Pauling's studies, started taking uh, vitamin C uh, for, the, for a cold that she had, and her idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura went away. And this has now been documented in a number of this fellow's patients in Canada. The mechanism is unclear. Okay, phagocytes. Next slide, please. What do phagocytes do? Well, uh, for those of you who don't know on a biochemical basis, you can think of phagocytes, they eat bacteria, they have to eat and kill bacteria. They have to respond to a signal, they have to move, there's chemotaxis to get to the site of the signal, the bacteria, they have to ingest the bacteria, phago to eat, cytosis, and then to kill it. And they have to do that before the bacteria kills the, the neutrophil, and the neutrophil has to kill that bacteria, but hopefully it's not going to kill surrounding tissue. So it's a tall order for a lymphocyte, for a neutrophil or a poly. Important, very important in patients who have cancer uh, and who are at risk for infection. What is the function of ascorbic acid in these neutrophils? Again, there have been reports and they vary. I will try very briefly to review what they are. And one of the interesting reports was in a movement disorder, Chidiakigashi syndrome, and vitamin C was reported to initially uh, restore movement to neutrophils. The problem was that this disorder is a heterogeneous one. It's not well defined, and this could not be repeated subsequently uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. There are other disorders that are associated with uh, neutrophil movement. They have to do with um, microtubule defects and uh, the ability of ascorbic acid perhaps to change microtubules in their composition. But again, we don't know what this means uh, with respect to neutrophils and with respect to neutrophils in cancer. And uh, there are some reports that, uh, that phagocytosis is, or the ability to eat bacteria is improved by vitamin C, but they don't always stand up. Okay, so we have, I think, what are possibilities, but it's not really clear what happens. And what we decided to do was to take this idea of how much does what and bring it to the neutrophil. And the idea was to ask, how can we do this? And in the next uh, slide, or actually, the next slide, please don't think this is your electrical engineering test when it comes up. We used a new kind of uh, detector to develop a new way to measure vitamin C in exquisitely low concentrations. And the concentrations can be as low as femtomoles, 10 to the minus 15th moles. And the reason to develop such an assay was that we could measure vitamin C not only in small amounts of human normal and abnormal cells, but in pieces, subcellular pieces of these cells. And just in a couple of examples follow. Next slide is 10 picomoles of vitamin C. And then we can get rid of it with ascorbic acid oxidase. And voila, I hope the peak will go away without the slide going away. <coughs> Next slide. And we can get down as low as about 50 femtomoles of vitamin C. And this allows us to then, we have a tool to measure. We can trust the tool. We can try to adjust the concentration in neutrophils as to get a clue on function. The next slide will show you simply, very simply, that vitamin C accumulation in neutrophils as a function of time goes up. But look at what we start with. This is millimolar vitamin C inside. Circulating vitamin C, even in this audience, uh, and many of you, I'm sure, take supplements, your circulating vitamin C is at best probably 100 micromolar, is my guess. So there's, there can be anywhere from a, 
uh, a 20 to a 50-fold accumulation of ascorbic acid by these neutrophils. And we can ask, and I, I'll just fly through these slides real fast, that the, the upshot of these slides is that there are two mechanisms of vitamin C accumulation in the first a uh, couple of slides. Next one, please. You can just see that there are two different components. And this is a little noisy here because there's already endogenous vitamin C that's present. If you look at label, next slide, we just get rid of that noise. And there are two components of vitamin C uptakes for any kineticist here. The first component follows. It's a very high affinity, rapid uptake system. Next slide. And the kinetics are in set, and you don't have to know that for the test. And the second, the second uh, component is a low affinity but very high capacity vitamin C transport system. Next slide, which is shown here. And this means that we can regulate vitamin C concentration in these neutrophils. But the next order of business was to try to get rid of the vitamin C. We could, we could certainly bring it up, but we wanted to be able to bring it down, and we didn't want to do it in patients with deficiency. And the long and the short of it was is that we tried to use glucose, which looks like vitamin C. And in the next slide, you can see that glucose, shown on the x-axis here, this is physiologic glucose, by the way, that ascorbic acid is exquisitely suppressed. The accumulation of ascorbic acid is exquisitely suppressed by normal amounts of glucose. And uh, this is true for both transport activities. And we characterized this in detail. The idea was that compounds of similar structure should influence the movement of the vitamin. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get rid of the vitamin C. The mechanism of the glucose action was a non-competitive mechanism. And the interpretation of that, or to translate that for you, means it ain't going to make what's inside exchange out and therefore lower the concentration. We were not successful that way. But there was something else that we found, which was really uh, very nice. And if you skip about four slides, I'll show you what it was. In the course of trying to figure out a couple more. In the course of trying to fit one more. In the course of trying to figure out how glucose worked on a, on a, on a uh, really a cellular and a, uh, a molecular uh, level, we, we ran into an accident. And that accident was that under certain conditions, we found that ascorbic acid accumulation in these cells actually went haywire. It went above the accumulation that I showed you. And it went up to 10 times as much. And here's just resting cells. And these are cells stimulated with different agonists. These agonists are what make neutrophils work. They make neutrophils make oxidants to kill bacteria. And this accumulation is really astounding. Uh, I'll show it to you by HPLC in the next slide. This is what we start with. I think these might have been even my neutrophils. And this is just a control of some kind. And this is a couple of different stimulants. And this is just the most powerful one. This is a very rapid stimulation. Furthermore, if you skip again a couple of more slides, this stimulation, go ahead, skip again, does not, right here, does not occur in a patient with chronic granulomatous disease. This is a patient who cannot make radicals. And I won't tell you the proof. What I skipped over was what's the mechanism. Uh, I don't want to go through the data. I'll tell you what the mechanism is. Next slide. We think we know what vitamin C might do in neutrophils. When neutrophils work, they make a phagosome to eat a bacteria. They make oxidants, which are pumped into this phagosome. They also leak these oxidants. They leak all over the place. They leak outside. And they leak outside, and they oxidize extracellular vitamin C. And that's what some of those slides were that I skipped over. That oxidized vitamin C, dehydroascorbic acid, and that is the form that we know uh, is, is generated here, is preferentially accumulated. It goes across the membrane in a way that we don't understand. Uh, we think it's sodium independent, very different than vitamin C transport, and probably a different carrier, and is immediately reduced inside back to ascorbic acid. And the mechanism is via glutathione oxidation through a pento shunt. But the, the idea here is that we, ha we have true antioxidant recycling. And what does this do? It really is a very nice function for ascorbic acid, and it relates to uh, cancer patients and immune cells, in that vitamin C outside is protecting from oxidant damage. And the, the protective waste, if you will, is recycled inside and is used to protect the neutrophil against these oxidants that are going to leak back into the neutrophil first. And these concentrations are really astounding. We didn't believe them for many months because I, I, said, I just couldn't understand how this was possible. And we now have very clear evidence that this is what happens. Next slide, please. 
So I think that this is one uh, uh, function down the road that's going to be very important for vitamin C action in neutrophils in patients who are subject to infection, such as the cancer patients and patients with immune deficiencies that you see. I can't tell you right now that this vitamin C will have use in treating abscesses and infection, but I bet, give us a few more years, we're going to try to show that this mechanism can be brought to the bedside. The other uh, immune cell that I want you to hear about is the lymphocyte. Here's a picture of a lymphocyte a bit out of focus. What I wanted to show you is that it's almost all nucleus. The nucleus is here, the red staining material. Here's a rim of, cytos of cytoplasm. This is actually a, a lymphocyte that's probably starting to differentiate. Here are just some red cells. And the issue is, is that what does vitamin C do in lymphocytes? Well, first I want to show you it's there. Next slide, please. Very high concentrations of vitamin C from normal lymphocytes. These are normal uh, B lymphocytes. It's true for T lymphocytes. And the vitamin C leaks out very rapidly under conditions of cell culture. And we can just bring it right back if we just restore physiologic concentrations of vitamin C, which is done where these arrows are. The gradients here are anywhere from 10 to 50 fold. What's this vitamin C doing? Well, remember I showed you that picture of a lymphocyte. It's all nucleus. And what we proposed, the idea was we can regulate the concentration just as I showed you before. How much does what? We're, we're not affected by the problem that we initially had with the neutrophil. We can regulate the concentration easily. So what's the reaction we're going to pick? And there was a guess, and the guess was that vitamin C is going to regulate an action of a cell that is primed to differentiate. And it's all nucleus. So vitamin C should regulate some aspect of nuclear function. What's that? Gene transcription. We didn't know which genes we were looking for. We just predicted that vitamin C would regulate gene transcription. I won't go through everything with you, but on the next slide, here's an example of one gene that is turned on in vitamin C supplemented cells, just the cells that were, had the normal concentration and it's not turned on in cells that didn't have vitamin C. We have a whole plethora of these genes. In the abstracts, there are two different numbers for things that are turned on and off, and that's simply because they represent normal or tumor cells. We're doing these experiments in both kinds of cells, and we're trying to identify these genes now. But the point is to use this idea of how much does what to get at the true function. Next slide, please. Okay, in the remaining two and a half minutes, I'm going to try to tell you or bring this back to the bedside. Uh, and I think it's important that I, I can talk about this. And that is, uh, and also tell you how the uh, government spends uh, all of our money in a good way. We, we, I can't have any meaning for these data alone without knowing what really happens in patients. It's very nice to show that vitamin C concentrations vary all over the place and that we can make things happen. But can we achieve these concentrations in human beings? What, what do we achieve in human beings? What can be achieved as a function of dose? And we decided that this issue was very important to answer in a rigorous way. And we are doing this study now at the National Institutes of Health. We bring in normal volunteers who live with us for five months on a vitamin C deficient diet. And I hope at the end that you will give them the applause that they so richly deserve. And that these people are then given different doses of vitamin C from as low as 30 milligrams to as high as several grams. The idea is to measure vitamin C everywhere and also to try to measure vitamin C function. These are the, this is an outline of the protocol. Uh, this protocol is a multi-million dollar protocol because of the duration of the stay of the patients. And the next slide are the data from the first patient, which is really the plateaus of each vitamin C dose. And what I think is really important is that there's a very rapid plateau occurs after the recommended dietary allowance, which is right there, which is in the worst possible place. This is only one patient. I can tell you that the second patient profile is identical. He is, the second patient is in the hospital right now. He is right here. His numbers can be superimposed here. The third patient is also in the hospital here somewhere. In tissue, next couple of slides, in neutrophil, uh, uh, you come back one. This is what happens in neutrophil, same kind of plateau, and in seminal fluid in the next slide, same plateau. So it's possible to get this information out of human beings. These are normal people. I don't know what happens in sick patients, and I think it's our responsibility to learn what happens in sick patients. I don't know what the function of food is, and because I told you before, glucose really is an effective inhibitor of vitamin C accumulation. We don't know how food affects this as well. But we believe that dose-response curve I showed you is really a true minimum requirement for ascorbic acid. And we hope to be able to show you this 
in 10 to 20 patients in the next few years if I survive the study. Next slide. I, I wanted to say a couple of words about vitamin C uh, assay. You can just leave it there. Um, I, was, I, I had some comments from, the spe uh, from questions raised by you for other sessions. I thought I could help some of the clinicians in the audience about vitamin C assays. Commercial assays that are available, uh, you want to be careful about which ones you use when you measure vitamin C in your patients. The best assay is an HPLC assay. It's not commercially available. Uh, the, the, the next assay, I'll be done in a second. The next assay is uh, that you'll hear about is a dinitrophenylhydrazine assay. And this is the assay to avoid. Ask your lab what they use. You don't want to use this assay because it measures artificial high concentrations of vitamin C when your patients may be low. It's the DNPH assay or dinitrophenylhydrazine. Avoid it. The assay that you want to look for that is commercially available is the ascorbic acid oxidase assay. I, I know that this is used by some major commercial laboratories. It's the one that you want to choose. Your samples have to be handled very judiciously, carefully. Protect your samples against light, keep them cold, and make sure that the lab does the same. And uh, in concluding, I, I want to tell you that I really believe that this approach of asking in a mechanistic way of how much does what will give us, I hope, new insight, will add to the power of epidemiology and give us new insight into how much we really need to stay healthy. Before I end, on the next slide are the people who are responsible for this work, and they really deserve your thanks. And I want to thank you for listening. Uh, Dr. Pauling will be right back, and while we're waiting, I just wanted to mention uh, it's very important in the 20th century to be flexible and adaptable and to be able to respond to changes in the schedule. So I mentioned this morning, not all of you were there at the time, that uh, we have uh, a couple of changes. Uh, I mentioned food and botanical extracts. We have Dr. Elliot Middleton that will be up and instead of Brian Lebowitz, who had a situational crisis. Also, uh, Dr. Carl Ransberger this afternoon at 5 o'clock had an emergency, uh, has a health problem. He's in Germany, felt he couldn't make the 20-hour flight, and that's okay with us. Uh, he's a good guy, but we certainly wish for his health. So instead of that, what we thought is that many of you have had input on would it be nice to have a clinical panel, and Dr. Werbach suggested that we could put together a group in that half hour. So what we are proposing at 5 o'clock, instead of Dr. Ransberger, is to have some of our physicians who are using nutrition as part of their oncology practice to get up at this panel and bring your questions, because I know that many of you came here for some basic science, and some of you came here for some clear-cut clinical applications. So the thought is uh, 5 o'clock will hopefully have a, the uh, expert panel ready to answer those questions. And uh, I guess everything else is on track. I think we're doing well. So it's OK. Dr. In Pauling? Yeah. Uh, uh, this is my great pleasure and honor, really, to introduce uh, Dr. Linus Pauling, who needs really no introduction, except to say that uh, he's one man who has done so much uh, for us, not only for science or for nutrition, but also for humanity. So I'm proud to welcome him, Linus. How do you tell when I am running out of time? Oh, she will flash a red light. I see. Yeah. So that's okay. We have time. Just, just one more little microphone, real quick. <coughs> this one I will go ahead and hook to your belt for you right there. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm very pleased to be here this great, on this great occasion when uh, uh, there's 
very valuable discussion going on about uh, uh, vitamins and cancer. During the last uh, weeks, recent weeks, Dr. Quillen telephoned several times to be sure that I brought my slides. <laughs> so I'll start by asking for the first slide and have the lights turned off. Let's see, Dr. Rath brought it up a few minutes ago. The first slide. Well, let me uh, go on. Well, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> the black dot is the upper right hand corner, putting it in. There we are. What does it say? Breast cancer patients. Stages three and four. These are patients who were registered with Dr. Hoffer, and uh, I hope that he will be talking about his patients, 143 of them. But these are the uh, 21 patients with breast cancer. I could have uh, could show similar slides for others. Uh, four of them refused to the vitamins and minerals, mainly vitamins. And I can't read what that says. 2.5. Tau equals 2.5. That's uh, the uh, length of time during which Half the pa essentially half the patients will have died. Uh, vitamin C, 17. Uh, 75. 75 months. 2.5 months, 75 months. And the use of the Hardin-Jones principle for analyzing a survival curve led to the conclusion uh, although the number of patients here was rather small, that there may be two sub-cohorts, six good responders, 10 months, uh, considerably more than the untreated breast cancer patients, and 11 excellent responders, 110 months. Well, the next slide, or the lights, please. Around 25 years ago, I became interested in vitamins for essentially the first time. Actually, I'm supposed to talk, give a historical talk about my interest in vitamins and cancer. So, uh, I started taking a vitamin mineral supplement in 1941, uh, just a standard one, the RDA. You know, I thought the, these fellows in the Food and Nutrition Board surely know what they're talking about, and uh, <laughs> so I accepted the RDAs and took this standard supplement for many years. Then, uh, 27 years ago, uh, Irwin Stone wrote to me after having heard me speak in New York and said that he was sending me copies of some papers that he wrote and he mentioned that I had uh, said in my talk in New York that I uh, would like to live 25 years longer because I uh, got so much happiness out of reading Science and Nature and Scientific Americans and other publications about the new discoveries about the nature of the universe that scientists kept making. And I wanted to continue to have that kind of happiness during the next 25 years. 
I may have mentioned that I, I don't think so in that case. I may have mentioned that I was troubled by having recurrent colds that put me in bed two or three times a year for two or three days. So he said that if I would take three grams of vitamin C per day, uh, I'd live not just 25 years longer, but 50 years longer. And uh, there were some cogent, quite rational arguments in the published papers for papers that he published in 1965 and 1966. So uh, I was so, uh, well, you know Victor Herbert. Have you heard of him? Uh, I gave a talk. I was asked to speak at the opening ceremonies of a new medical school in New York, Mount Sinai. It's where Victor Herbert is now. He uh, was there then, too, but he was away uh, somewhere else. We got fired from the other <laughs> medical school, but he's back, I judge, at Mount Sinai. And I thought, uh, well, I have 10 minutes. Georgia Beadle was speaking and a couple of others. I have 10 minutes. What can I say at a medical school? Well, I'll say, this was in 1969, I'll say that uh, if you take three grams of vitamin C per day, that'll control the common cold. And Victor Herbert wrote me a very vituperative letter, just giving me the devil, and said, uh, uh, can you point out a single randomized prospective double-blind study that shows that vitamin C has any greater value than a placebo? I looked through the literature and wrote, giving him four references to studies of that sort. He wrote back saying he was too busy to hunt those up in the <laughs> library. So I made Xerox copies and sent them to him. <laughs> and he wrote back quibbling. You know, he said, here's this paper uh, by Ritzel. Uh, I don't know whether the subjects are, uh, well, I don't know the sex of the subjects or the age of the subjects. And, so I wrote to Ritzel, but actually the paper, which was in German, I guess Victor Herbert uh, isn't very well educated. Uh, <laughs> it was clear from the paper that they were schoolboys, not schoolgirls. They were schoolboys, so the sex was taken care of and the age in a certain sense. Ritzel said they were 16 to 18 years old and all male. And Victor Herbert still quibbled, tried to find reasons for not accepting that. And he's got so in the habit of doing that that you can't trust anything that he says now. <laughs> he's so biased. And they, <laughs> the great exemplar of uh, uh, an authority in medicine, at least he seems to be considered that, uh, with a strong bias against vitamins. Well, by this time, I would got so interested that uh, in August of 1970, I wrote my book, Vitamin C and the Common Cold, which was published in November. And uh, while I was looking up material in the literature about vitamin C, I came across papers about vitamin C and cancer, mainly by physicians in the period around 1940, when there was much interest in the vitamins. So uh, I was asked to speak, asked by Charlie Huggins to speak at the dedication of a new cancer research laboratory, of which he was the president director in Chicago. Um, but the speaker, Tezelius, had become ill a week before the ceremony, and so Charlie called on me. And I thought, I need to say something about cancer. So I said, uh, if people were to take large doses of proper <laughs> amounts of vitamin C, the death rate, the age standardized mortality from cancer, I estimated from what I've read in the literature, uh, could be decreased by 10%. Well, I say now, then I start saying by 25%, by 50, by 
50% by 75%, and now I say by 87.5%. Uh, that means cutting it down to an eighth of the present value. And uh, this doesn't mean preventing cancer, it just means postponing it by 24 years, if you cut, according to the Gumpert's relationship. Well, so over 25 years, even though it seems seemed to me and still does that this is a sort of boring subject uh, compared with work on the structure of the atomic nucleus or that sort of thing. Uh, I've devoted a large fraction of my time to learning more about uh, vitamin C in relation to health and other vitamins too. So uh, I began giving talks about vitamin C and I would make a series of slides. By the way, that was my last slide as well as my first slide. <laughs> <laughs> I'd make a series of slides and I felt that it was my duty as an honest person to put down on the slides everything that I knew. The result was that when I presented the slides, uh, there was somewhere between 10 and 100 times as much information on the slides as one could expect to communicate to the audience in a half hour or an hour. And uh, the consequence is that I've pretty much given up uh, using slides. But Dr. Quillen wanted me to bring... <laughs> I didn't really, this was a compromise. I didn't bring slides, I brought one slide. I so, what happens? Someone shows a slide that has 10 or 15 different statements, and while the audience is looking at the slide, he talks about something, or she, talks about, you know, I'm sensitive now to this. <laughs> he or she talks about uh, something else. And the audience tries to read the slide and tries to listen to the speaker at the same time. And the result is that an hour later, he or she doesn't remember anything about uh, what was on the slide or what the speaker presented. Well, fortunately, most of the slides are Ill illegible to the audience. <laughs> uh, the speaker is five feet away, and he says, well, I can read that slide, so the people 50 feet away ought to be reading it, too. Why are they illegible? Partially because there's so much on the slide that the letters are small. Sometimes, even if there isn't very much on the slide, the letters are small, and most of it is just white space. And then, too, uh, often the slides are white on black, rather than black letters on white. And the white on black are much harder to read than the black on white, but uh, it's become popular the last 20 years to have white on black, or even worse, to have light blue letters on a dark blue background, or, <laughs> or perhaps have uh, black on a tan background. And all of these mean that the contrast isn't so great, and, the, and people have difficulty reading the slides, too. And of course, one factor is many people in the audience have some visual impairment. If you have black on white, then there's a big white space which causes the uh, iris to contract and uh, this helps the visual acuity of people in the audience. If you have white on black, uh, this effect doesn't operate. Uh, the, visual, the visual impairment uh, becomes a problem. And of course, with the white on black, the white isn't white, it's a light gray, and the black isn't black, it's a somewhat darker gray, so there isn't very much con uh, contrast uh, there. Well, uh, I've said enough about slides. I'll go <laughs> on with uh, my historical account. I've mentioned that uh, 
I owe my career in the vitamin field to Victor Herbert, uh, <laughs> who irritated me so much that I wrote the book Vitamin C in the Common Cold, and in the course of reading the literature, got interested in vitamin C and cancer, and have retained that interest uh, ever since. And after two or three years, we set up our institute where our main focus for 19 years has been on vitamin C and other nutrients in relation especially to cancer, but to some extent also in other diseases. What about vitamin C? Why do I think that it's so important? Well, uh, Irwin Stone thought it was very important. and I've taken over uh, several of his arguments. Uh, I think it's more important than the other vitamins. Well, all vitamins are essential, so that uh, this is almost a meaningless statement. They're essential for life. But the difference between the RDA and the optimum intake is larger for vitamin C than for the other vitamins. I think, on the basis of what knowledge I have. Well, something happened in between the time that Irwin Stone wrote to me and the time I published my book, Vitamin C and the Common Cold. I didn't have any thought of uh, getting involved in this vitamin field for several years. But by accident, one day, while my wife and I were visiting some friends in the guest room uh, during an hour or two when we were free, I looked at what books there were in the guest room. They were the usual books that uh, nobody would be very interested in, but uh, <laughs> there was a book by Abram Hoffer and Humphrey Osmond and a collection of papers. Our hostess was a psychiatrist, a collection of papers by them. So I read the book and the papers. And uh, I wasn't especially interested in the fact that they were using vitamins to control schizophrenia. But a few days later, after I read this, I thought, you know, there's something that I read that bothers me. I knew enough, not knowing much about medicine, but I knew enough to know that doctors give valuable drugs, a valuable drug that might control some disease in the amount that they think uh, the patient can stand. In that, almost certainly, if you increase the intake of the drug, you will have a better chance of controlling the serious disease. But there's a limit. The limit is the toxicity, the lethal character of a high dose. So they go up close to the lethal limit and stop there. And uh, uh, 40 years or 50 years ago, they knew that uh, uh, the drug, that they couldn't go beyond the limit, the amount that they are prescribing uh, because of the lethality. And what I remembered was that Hoffer and Osmond were giving a thousand times RDA of vitamin B3 and vitamin C to patients, and, or even as much as 10,000 times. Or uh, It's astonishing. I thought, uh, uh, here's something. Here I am, well, let's say 67 years old then in 1968. Here I am, 67 years old with a rather broad interest in almost everything. And I'd never heard about substances of that sort that have very powerful physiological activity in a minute dose, and yet are so lacking in toxicity that you can take a 1,000 or 10,000 times that much without killing yourself. And that caused me to say, there really are two questions about the vitamins. One, what are the amounts that will keep you barely alive? 
not dying of scurvy or beriberi or pellagra or other deficiency disease? That's one question. And I agree with the Food and Drug Administration, the Food and Nutrition Board that sets RDAs, that the RDAs are, as they say, enough to prevent development of deficiency, signs of deficiency, in nearly all persons in ordinary good health. What I object to is the expression ordinary good health. They should say ordinary poor health, of course. If you just take the RDAs of these vitamins, you are in ordinary poor health. To be in ordinary good health, you need to have a different intake. So the other question is, if you have a thousand-fold or ten-thousand-fold range over which the substances have physiological activity, starting with the very important one of keeping you alive, where in this great range of intakes is the optimum intake? So I thought, well, I've never heard about this, but I don't know much about medicine and things, health and vitamins, so I'll just look in the literature and find what the optimum intakes are. I didn't find anything about the optimum intakes in the literature, except Irwin Stone and, uh, 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 let's see, Frederick, what is his name? Klenner, Fred Klenner, uh, two people whom I knew, I was a good friend, knew Irwin Stone very well, met Fred Klenner and his wife a couple of times. Well, there were a few people who uh, were interested in this question, but there wasn't really very much information. So, for 25 years, well, so I uh, thought, what did Hoffer and Rosamond write about? They wrote about megavitamins, megavitamin C, substances that are normally present in the human body, required for life, and have very low toxicity. And I know other substances that aren't vitamins that can be put in the same category substances required for life, uh, present in the body in a certain level, and with very low or low or not much toxicity. So I invented the term orthomolecular substance and said orthomolecular medicine consists in regulating the amounts of these important substances so as to get the best of health and the greatest control over disease. Well, for example, cholesterol is a very valuable substance. And uh, it's required by all cells, my understanding, yes. And of course, we have a mechanism, mainly LDL, lipoprotein, uh, low-density lipoprotein, which carries cholesterol from the liver where it's synthesized out through the rest of the body. Very important substance. I just read a paper by uh, Harry Pemelo, uh, in which he uh, checked the literature. Well, he started in another paper by checking the literature on the common cold. He said he would look to see what publications there were about uh, vitamin C in relation to the common cold, control trials comparing it with a placebo on a double-blind basis, and with at least one gram per day given over a period of time of several months, uh, and published since my 1970 book came out on vitamin C and the common cold. Well, there were he found 32 controlled trials. Uh, in 31 of them, the vitamin C subjects had fewer 
less illness from the common cold than the placebo subjects, and in the 32nd, there was the same amount of illness. So the statement that the Food and Nutrition Board makes that there's no evidence that high doses of vitamin C have any value against the common cold or any other disease uh, are just wrong with respect to the common cold. There's plenty of evidence. And then there were about 20 studies where people who came down with the cold were then on the first day given a gram or two of vitamin C and that was kept up on succeeding days. And the ones who got the vitamin C had a shorter period of illness than the ones who got the placebo. There were two studies, one by the Common Gold Research Unit in England, which has been disbanded now, uh, that uh, gave a negative result. In each of these two studies, the people were given three grams a day, starting on the first day, for three days. And then the vitamin C was stopped. Well, both the placebo subjects and the vitamin C subjects were ill for six days on the average. But the point there is that you shouldn't stop the vitamin C after three days, but just keep on. Well, this other paper by Hemelo is uh, on vitamin C and blood constituents. And it has 270 references to control trials that have been carried out. Many of them, about half of them, give uh, results of high statistical significance, and the other half uh, don't come up to p equal 0 0.5, which is, of course, quite an arbitrary limit. But uh, Hemelo says they're just as significant as, for, perhaps I'll remember to say why he says that. So uh, 40 of them were studies in which uh, cholesterol level was measured as a function of the ascorbate, the regular ascorbate intake. And uh, Hemelo divided the subjects into three groups. There were those who had low cholesterol, 130 milligrams per deciliter, say, those who had an intermediate amount, 160 or 70, and those who had high cholesterol, 200, 220, and so on. The ones with low cholesterol had their cholesterol level increased by vitamin C. The ones with intermediate cholesterol showed no change. The ones with high cholesterol had the cholesterol level dropped. And he mentions in his paper that the Food and Nutrition Board refers to the work of Emil Ginter in Czechoslovakia, who has written a book and a number of papers about his observations on vitamin C and cholesterol, where he reported high cholesterol patients who take a gram of vitamin C a day have quite a drop in their cholesterol. And then goes on to say, but there is another study in which no effect was observed. And so they accept the other study. Well, this other study involved eight subjects who initially had about 160 or 170 milligrams of cholesterol per deciliter and didn't show any change. They just ignored the 39 other studies. Well, they mentioned Ginter, but said it's been refuted by this fellow's study of eight subjects. It's astonishing t to me that such, and it is to Hemelo too, that this selectivity in reference by the Food and Nutrition Board astonishes him. Well, then there were about 30 studies in which uh, people w <coughs> had their cholesterol level measured and the vitamin C level in the blood measured, or their vitamin C intake. And here again, you had the same sort of results on vitamin C and cholesterol. So there's no doubt about vitamin C and cholesterol. Ginter pointed out that we know that vitamin C serves many functions, 
And many of them, it doesn't it isn't a coenzyme the way the other vitamins are, but many of these functions are uh, the uh, involvement in hydroxylation reactions. And in some of these reactions, there have been quantitative studies. For every hydroxyl group introduced, uh, one ascorbate is destroyed. So if you want these hydroxylation reactions to go on at a good rate, you need to have a high intake of ascorbate. One of these reactions, Ginter pointed out, is hydroxylation of cholesterol to bile acids. Uh, a man in the kidneys, or in the liver, manufactures about 4,000 milligrams of cholesterol a day. If there weren't some way of destroying it, pretty soon he would be nothing but cholesterol. And the mechanism of getting rid of it is to uh, hydroxylate it to bile acids, which are then uh, moved into the intestine along the bile duct and got rid of, but not completely. If you are constipated, uh, there's a lot of reabsorption of the bile acids in the lower bowel and they are reconverted to cholesterol. So I take enough, by the way, I'm not going to talk about side effects of vitamin C because it has, has practically none. I knew a man, who, a chemist, who used to, working for IBM in San Jose, who used to come in and see me about every six months. He had metastatic prostatic cancer, about 20 metastases in different parts of his body. He had been given four months or six months to live by the doctors. As a chemist, he thought he would see if he couldn't handle a problem. And he, after he tried two or three things, but came to vitamin C and uh, felt when he took a gram or two of vitamin C that he didn't have so much pressure pain from the metastases in the bones, growing metastases in the bones. So he increased the intake until he no longer had pain from these metastases. Uh, he got up to 130 grams of vitamin C per day, and that, uh, I assume that that's what kept him alive for 13 years. He finally died. I've never checked up. I didn't want to disturb his widow, and besides, there are a lot of other things that I've... So I never checked up to find what was put down as the cause of death. But he hung on for 13 years, taking his 130 grams of vitamin C per day. Well, of course, it's very cheap compared to the medicines <laughs> that run a dollar or five dollars per pill, perhaps. Uh, vitamin C, two cents per gram, doesn't cost much, but Hoffman LaRoche, during the last years of his life, uh, gave him vitamin C, sent it in by the barrel, perhaps. <laughs> I asked him how he took the vitamin C, and he said 90% uh, sodium ascorbate and 10% uh, Ascorbic acid that, that I've pulled my 10% ascorbic acid uh, to improve the taste. 10% ascorbic acid, and you know, that's a lot of sodium, sodium ascorbate. Well, the molecular weight's 173 compared to sodium chloride, 36. 23, uh, 59 or 60, uh, a lot of sodium. But people at UC San Francisco Medical School have shown that sodium ascorbate does not have the uh, hypertensogenic effect of sodium chloride. It isn't the sodium ion by itself anyway. Uh, that's the main problem. Well. I calculated a while back that you want to minimize the work on the kidney. You do that, the osmotic work of concentrating substances. 
You do that by having the same concentration of sodium chloride in the urine that you have in the blood. And that means taking something like seven or eight grams of sodium chloride per day. Of course, if you have edema going on, a minimum salt diet can help get rid of the edema. I don't think this is an argument to have everybody try to go down to uh, three or four grams of sodium chloride per day. Well, what about Erwin Stone's arguments about the need for vitamin C? He said, human beings and the primates and the guinea pig are about the only mammals that uh, require ascorbate. All of the other animals manufacture ascorbate. And this makes vitamin C different from the other uh, vitamins. Uh, essentially, all species of animals require exogenous vitamin A and B1 and B6 and so on, uh, but not ascorbate. What happened 600 million years ago? Here we had the animals running around eating their plant ancestors. Well, the biochemistry of plants and animals is very closely similar, essentially the same. And the needs for these important substances are pretty much the same for plants and animals. So uh, the animals were eating the plants and getting a good supply of these various vitamins but they also had the machinery for manufacturing them. When a mutant came along, that, or a series of mutants that had lost the ability to make these vitamins, that mutant was uh, in an advantageous position to have more progeny, could run faster and so on, not being burdened by this unnecessary machinery. So the wild type died out and the mutant took over. That didn't happen with vitamin C. Instead, almost all animals continued to manufacture vitamin C. Why? I said the need for these substances is nearly the same for plants and animals, and that's true of vitamin C only to a limited extent. There are a lot of hydroxylation reactions that plants and animals have in common need vitamin C. But there's one very important one that plants don't have. The principal structural macromolecule of animals is collagen, the protein collagen. Whereas the principal structural macromolecule of plants is a, a carbohydrate, a cellulose. So animals have a special need for quite a lot of vitamin C, extra vitamin C, in order to make enough collagen to be strong, to have their tissues strong. So that's why most animals have manufactured, continued to manufacture vitamin C. What happened 40 million years ago? In a tropical valley, there was the common ancestor of the primates eating food that provided perhaps what we would call on the present basis several 150 pounds body weight, 100 or something like 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C. And then for this animal, our common ancestor with the primates, uh, the circumstances were such that a mutant who had lost the ability to manufacture the enzyme that in the last step in the production of ascorbate won out. That was a bad accident for human beings. Not so bad for other primates because most of them continued to live in tropical regions eating foods that had a lot of of vitamin C. A bird, the red vented bulbul in India, uh, also lost the ability to manufacture vitamin C, whereas uh, other birds for the most part have it. Well, this bird is, uh, uh, lives on fruit largely. I forgot to mention a fruit-eating bat, which is also 
one that uh, requires exogenous C, but of course it's a fruit-eating bat, so it's getting a lot of vitamin C in its food, continues to get vitamin C in its food. Then Erwin Stone said, how much vitamin C do these animals manufacture? An amount proportional to body weight. And it comes out of roughly 12 grams per day, 12,000 milligrams per day, when you convert it to uh, 154 pounds, 70 kilograms. Here I think we have a very powerful argument for the conclusion that something like 12,000 milligrams per day is the optimum intake of ascorbate. I wrote a paper in 1968, my first paper in this vitamin field, <coughs> called uh, Orthomolecular Psychiatry, in which I uh, pointed out that, uh, well, several things using physical chemical arguments. One, if you take an animal such as the goat, I've used the goat as uh, an example, uh, a 154 pound goat has been found, at least the one, one or ones that were studied, to manufacture 13 grams of vitamin C per day. And I say, here, generation after generation, goats manufacture this large amount. Why don't they cut it to 12 grams a day and save 8% of the materials and energy? The answer must be that the 13th gram is valuable to the goat. Well, I started taking three grams of vitamin C in 1966, I guess, and then went up to six grams, and then went up three grams, this is 50 times RDA, then to six grams, uh, 100 times, and then to 12 grams, uh, 200 times, and for a number of years, I've been taking 18 grams, uh, 300 times RDA. The limit in my case, and many other people have a similar limit, is a result of the fact that ascorbate is a laxative. It uh, stimulates the production of Ig, IgM, I guess it is, in the gut, which draws water into the gut. Uh, aspirin, of course, has opposite effect of and as a result, it uh, produces uh, the opposite effect to being a laxative. Well, uh, so uh, I uh, don't take enough for this laxative effect to be a nuisance, but I take it enough to be a significant laxative effect every day. And what do I achieve? Well. It moves the contents of the gut, these waste products, through the lower bowel a day or two faster than otherwise. This means I don't get so much reabsorption of the bile acids. Why should you carry that stuff around longer than necessary? You know? <laughs> and the, uh, consider, for example, fiber. How does fiber? which stays in the intestinal contents, what does it do to be valuable? Well, it's hygroscopic, absorbs water, increases the volume of the waste material, and the result is that you eliminate it faster. And moreover, by increasing the volume, the ratio of area to volume is decreased, and that means that there's a an additional mechanism for interfering with the reabsorption of the bile acids and lower bowel. There may be a lot of other things that happen if you carry this waste material around longer than you need to. Well, I gave a talk in 1970, 1970 uh, for Charlie Huggins. And uh, uh, it was, there was an account of it in the New York Times when I said that proper use of vitamin C should decrease the mortality of cancer patients by an estimated 10%. Uh, 
Ewan Cameron in Scotland was sent an account of this, a clipping, and t wrote to me asking how much vitamin C he should give his cancer patients. He had been interested in cancer for many years and had written a book in 1966, Hyaluronidase and Cancer. And I wrote back saying 10 grams a day, this argument about how much the animals manufacture caused me to say that. I said 10 grams rather than 12 grams, perhaps uh, somewhat simpler integer on the decimal system. Uh, so he began giving 10 grams a day of vitamin C to his cancer patients who had uh, uh, reached in Scottish medical practice the untreatable stage. And he took as his controls the cancer patients who were in charge in the same hospital of other physicians uh, who didn't give vitamin C and who had reached the untreatable stage too. And the assignment of cancer patients to him, he was a chief surgeon, but uh, there were others. The assignment occurred to, the, to him and the others, depending upon who was on duty the day that the patient was registered in a hospital. So there was a randomizing effect and he was able to compare the life expectancies, the survival times, starting at the day of when the patient was considered to be untreatable with only, and in fact, when palliative drugs perhaps were dropped too, but uh, pain controllers, narcotics were given and good uh, nursing care. Well, the results were, uh, of course, published in the book by Cameron and me, Cancer and Vitamin C, uh, 14, 15 years ago. The results were that Cameron's patients survived about six times as long after reaching the untreatable stage as the other patients in the same hospital. Very high statistical significance. It was such a pronounced effect that didn't need to carry out uh, an analysis except for the fact that the people in the field require that you do a biostatistical analysis. So uh, then Dr. Morishiga in Japan published a paper on similar results that he had obtained. He had been interested in vitamin C since he was a medical student, or for his MD degree, he submitted a thesis on vitamin C. Uh, and he began giving vitamin C 10 grams a day to cancer patients and got similar results. Uh, three or four years ago, uh, Abram Hoffer wrote to me asking me if I would be interested in collaborating with him on the analysis of his patients. And by the time the shutoff date had reached, he had 143 <coughs> patients with advanced cancer who had been registered with him. The date of registration is time t equals zero for him, the date when he first had contact with the patient. And he, they were referred to him because they had become not exactly psychotic perhaps, but severely depressed or had severe anxiety. He's a psychiatrist and he'll talk about this. But at any rate, uh, the analysis of his patients, 43 of whom 42 of whom had uh, uh, refused the treatment that he gave his psychiatric patients and had been giving them for 40 years, uh, and 101 of whom the, 20, the 
17 that I mentioned here had followed the, the breast cancer patients, had followed the regimen. The results for all of these patients were closely similar to what I showed on this slide. Uh, if you take all 101 compared with the 40, three, 42, uh, the uh, factor of increased longevity after registering with Dr. Hoffer is 16, varies from about 12 to 21 for different kinds of cancer patients. Better than Cameron's results. Well, Cameron, well, of course, Scotland is different from British Columbia. There are many factors that are different. Uh, Cameron's results were uh, obtained with patients receiving only 10 grams of vitamin C per day. Uh, about 1973, uh, when my wife and I were in Scotland with the Camerons, I said, uh, I think you ought to give extra vitamin E and the B vitamins and vitamin A uh, to these patients. And he said, no, we first have to prove that vitamin C has value. Then we can check. Well, of course, this is what Hoffer did. He gave not only vitamin C, averaged 12 grams per day to the patients who registered with him, but a large amount of vitamin B3, 1,500 to 3,000 milligrams per day, which he and Osmond had found to be important for controlling schizophrenia, and uh, the other B vitamins, 25 or 50 times the usual amounts, or 100, well, 25 or 50 times, uh, 50 milligrams a day of each, or for most of them, or 100 milligrams a day. And vitamin E, 800 IU per day, and with considerably better results. So it isn't just vitamin C, although vitamin C may be the most important one. 50 of these 101 patients were still alive at the close of the study, the termination date. The termination date for including them in the study had been a year and a half before that, but now another two years and a half has gone by. This paper, you know, was published a couple of years ago in the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine. So here we have evidence that these orthomolecular substances, vitamins, he also gives selenium and some other minerals, zinc, uh, these orthomolecular substances have great value in controlling cancer. They also have value in controlling heart disease, diabetes, and other diseases. I remember the American Medical Association said that anybody who claims that he knows something that will be good for you no matter what's wrong with you is a quack. So I used to go around and say, I know something that's good for you no matter what's wrong with you, vitamin C. So that makes me a quack. Three years ago, something happened to me. For about a dozen years, I had known a young medical student. And uh, after a while, I said to Matthias Rath, I said to him, uh, even though it's important, this is something I've said to some of my grandchildren who are doing graduate work. Don't just sit there, get busy and get your doctor's degree. So I said, work hard and get your MD degree. And perhaps you ought to think about not just practicing medicine, but becoming a medical researcher. So he got his MD degree, and he carried out with some collaborators a very remarkable study. They analyzed plaques from patients who had had bypass operations, uh, atherosclerotic plaques, and were able to show that the plaques consist not of LDL, 
itself, which everyone has assumed, but of a protein, a different protein that's usually just ignored, not reported, lipoprotein A, small a, lipoprotein A. That's all. That's what the plaques are. Uh, it had been known that there was a lipoprotein A in the plaques, but uh, I think assumed by earlier investigators that that was just an impurity in the LDL. So uh, he came to see me three years ago and was telling me about lipoprotein A. I didn't know anything about it. And he said, uh, uh, it's interesting that the only animals that have a lot of lipoprotein A in their blood are human beings and the anthropoid apes. Other animals don't have much. They have the genes, they make small amounts of lipoprotein A or apoprotein A, but uh, they don't have a good concentration in their blood. I said, you know, those are the animals that, that don't manufacture vitamin C. So we decided that uh, apoprotein A is a surrogate for vitamin C. Uh, but how about the guinea pig, I asked him. Well, he said, nobody has measured the guinea pig. A lot of other animals have been studied, but not the guinea pig. So he measured the guinea pig and found a lot of lipoprotein A in guinea pig blood, too. Well, there's epidemiological evidence that people who have, uh, in fact, lipoprotein A is remarkable for the range of amounts in the blood of different individual human beings. Some have very little, less than 10 milligrams per deciliter. And they have a moderate incidence of cardiovascular disease, death from heart, at least mortality from cardiovascular disease. And those with between 10 and 20 milligrams per deciliter uh, have a much lower mortality from cardiovascular disease. Those with more than 20, 20 to 100 or more, uh, tend to die from cardiovascular disease. So uh, we concluded that uh, lipoprotein A is a surrogate for vitamin C in a special respect. Vitamin C is required for synthesizing collagen, which strengthens the arteries along with other tissues, the skin, the bones, the teeth, and so on. And uh, most people are deficient in vitamin C, and so their bodily tissues aren't very strong, including the arteries. They tend to get lesions. Athero, then the uh, lipoprotein A is laid down in the walls of the arteries and strengthens them. But if you don't have enough lipoprotein A, then the art arteries are not very strong. And everybody is deficient in vitamin C, collagen. If you have enough, that's fine. You're protected. If you have too much, then you've overshot the mark and deposit atherosclerotic plaques of lipoprotein A. And the amount of time during which cardiovascular disease has been important is not very great. In the old days, people died at age 25 or 30. Their life expectancy was down low. And not many of them died from cardiovascular disease. But in recent years, there's been enough control of infectious diseases and in other ways. The life expectancy has been increased and cardiovascular disease has become the principal cause of death in the developed countries. So the result of that is that uh, the amount of time has not been enough to stabilize the level of uh, lipoprotein A in the blood. Whereas most substances in the blood are pretty well controlled at the 
approximately the optimum level, usually a little. If you manufacture the substance, usually you don't make the optimum amount, but somewhat less than the optimum amount because there's a factor of the drain on the human econ bodily economy of manufacturing more. So uh, lipoprotein A hasn't been stabilized yet in this way. It's essentially people who have high lipoprotein A who are at risk for death by cardiovascular disease. We know a way of preventing these plaques from being deposited or of pulling them loose after they are deposited. And it's an orthomolecular method. And of course, we've published a paper about it. We also have published a paper saying, here, Brown and Goldstein and other cardiologists have said that the primary cause of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease in general is the lesion in the arterial wall. Well, why does that lesion occur? Because you don't have enough vitamin C to manufacture enough collagen to prevent the lesion from forming in the places of stress, such as in the arteries close to the heart or where there's a bifurcation. So, it isn't that a lesion in the wall of the artery is the primary cause of atherosclerosis. It's just part of the mechanism. The primary cause is hypoascorbemia, not having enough vitamin C. Well, I'm not going to, I don't have time to tell you how to prevent uh, atherosclerosis or to reverse it, uh, but uh, Anybody who gets in contact with me or with Dr. Rath, who made this great discovery and is here, just sitting over here, uh, can get a copy of our paper, or several papers in this field. And you know, you don't need to wait for the FDA to approve this. <laughs> it's a pure, purely orthomolecular. Just vitamins and amino acids, essential amino acids. So you can go ahead. If you have a patient who is suffering from chest pains or who is on the verge of requiring a, a bypass operation, try the treatment that we have tried in a few patients so far. Only one case history published so far. You won't. I, I don't think you'll get into any trouble. The FDA might raid your office the way they did Jonathan Wright's office in the state of Washington, but I think it's doubtful. There's evidence in the literature about this. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.